Ramon Navarro defied his family and fled his home in Mexico, a sumptuous paradise known as the Garden of Eden, for the dark and dangerous world of Los Angeles. He was handsome, athletic, charming, and talented, but like so many others, good fortune played a role in realizing his dream of becoming a star. And what a star he became. By the late 1920s, he was MGM's leading man. His star faded, his name was forgotten, he turned to alcohol. And then one fateful day, a member of his staff arrived at the Navarro home to find a brutally shocking scene. This is the story of the dramatic rise and fall of Ramon Navarro. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. the Samaniego family welcomed their first child to the Garden of Eden, Dr. Mariano N. Samaniego, and his wife, Leonor Perez Gavilans, firstborn was named Emilio. And over the years, 12 more siblings joined the family. Somewhere in the middle was Ramon. At this time, Mexico, like many countries, experienced high birth and mortality rates among infants and children. This meant that by his first birthday, Ramon had become the eldest male child to survive, having been born on February 6, 1899. Although he was given an astonishing 14 names, he chose the more modest quartet of Jose Ramon Gil Samaniego as his preferred name upon reaching adulthood. Ramon's elder sisters assumed the responsibility of caring for the younger siblings, but Ramon himself was looked after by Senora Samaniego. Their bond was strengthened by common interests in music and theater. This love of the arts led Senora Samaniego to take Ramon to music lessons. His mother, envisioning a future for him as a concert pianist, started teaching him piano at six. His musical education soon expanded to include vocal training, leading him to sing in church choirs. Also at the age of six, Ramon wearing a charming cotton wig performed for the first time in a duo with his sister Guadalupe during their grandmother's birthday party. They recited Quien Supiera Escribir, If Only I Could Write, by Spanish poet Ramon Campo Amor, about an illiterate girl who asks a priest to write a letter to her sweetheart. Encouraged by the applause, Ramon then went on to host puppet shows in a marionette theater that his mother gifted him on his eighth birthday. Religious and familial devotion were deeply intertwined in the Samaniego household. Every night the children knelt to receive their mother's blessing before bed, a Catholic tradition that elevated the stature of parents to that of saints. These rituals ingrained themselves deeply into Ramon's young mind, and he would grow up with a very classic Catholic guilt complex. Herbert Howe, Navarro's future publicist and romantic companion, observed a notable lack of outward affection in the family. Compliments were never paid, he said. In fact, Howe said, that if anyone in the Samaniego family did anything for another family member, thanks were only ever given to God, and not to the person who had performed the favor or offered the gift. Howe suggested that this emotional restraint in Novaro's upbringing might explain the lack of warmth he himself showed later in life. The peaceful times of the Samaniego family and the Garden of Eden came to a sudden end in the early 1910s. This decade was marked by two significant adversities. Dr. Samaniego, who was just in his early 40s, developed facial neuralgia, a condition that brought on abrupt, intense pains in the nerves on the right side of his face. The surgeries he underwent necessitated the removal of some facial nerves each time, eventually leading to major damage to his optical nerves. This physical incapacity forced him to give up his dental practice. He started teaching English at the Instituto Juarez, but without his dental income, the family's financial situation took a hit. Ramon, the oldest of his children, was just entering his teenage years, making him too young to contribute financially. The year 1910 also set the stakes for the Mexican Revolution, 
which erupted following the controversial defeat of landowner and industrialist Francisco E. Madero in the summer's presidential election. In November, after escaping to the United States, Madero launched a rebellion against President Diaz's regime, leading to its collapse months later, even after Diaz's resignation and flight to Paris. The conflict raged on, with various revolutionary and counter-revolutionary factions vying for control. Durango found itself caught in this unrest. By May 1911, the town faced attacks from bandits and rebels, largely comprised of dispossessed peasants. The Samaniegos, belonging to the urban upper class and therefore at great risk, fled to Mexico City, a place that had regained some stability. There, living with affluent relatives, the children resumed their education. Ramon was enrolled in the esteemed Instituto Científico de México, which was established by Jesuit priests. Ramon, now 14, received military training, excelled as an athlete and track star, and balanced his rigorous physical regimen with studies in music, French, and English. By the spring of 1915, the family had finally regrouped in Durango as the revolution began to somewhat wind down. At 16, Ramon had grown into a defiant young man. However, inspired by his sisters who had chosen the path of becoming nuns, Ramon started to contemplate a life in religion. Reflecting on this period later in life, he jokingly explained his youthful aspiration to, as he worded it, die a martyr and be canonized. He took up fasting, chose to sleep on the floor without blankets, took on the chores of servants, woke up at five every morning, and adopted the humble demeanor of keeping his eyes lowered, mimicking religious devotion. This act of piety earned him the mockery of local children, who would sing Ave Maria upon seeing him, poking fun at his overzealous religious demeanor. However, Ramon's aspirations for martyrdom and sainthood quickly faded, once he discovered a passion for opera. The dream of priesthood was shelved, at least for a while, after he came across an old advertisement for a metropolitan opera performance, featuring Enrico Caruso and Geraldine Farrar in Manon. His admiration had also been captured by the then incomplete Palacio de Bellas Artes during his stay in the capital, recalling his impressions for Screenland magazine in 1929 Navarro said, In Mexico City, the opera is a beautiful place, describing it as a wonderful temple of music, comparable only to the Paris opera in grandeur. The opulent costumes and sets, along with the social status and the alluring world of opera, lured him away from the austere life of a monastery. Navarro later said, Perhaps it was the devil tempting me. I'm still not so sure it wasn't, in September 1916, at the age of 17, Ramon and his brother Mariano took a train north towards Texas. Partway through the journey, in the small town of Escalon, the train was halted because a bridge ahead had been destroyed. Soon after, they learned that the bridge to Durango was also destroyed. For two days, surviving on dry tortillas, beans, and unclean water, Ramon was plagued with anxiety that the rebel leader, Pancho Villa, might raid the town and cut off his ears. A catastrophic thought for someone aspiring to a career in music. Relief came with the arrival of a train from Torreon, carrying bridge repair workers. However, doubting the reliability of the repairs, Ramon chose to return to Durango on foot with his brother. Upon their return, Senora Samaniego, saw the bridge collapse as a divine intervention for them to stay home. Ramon retorted, maybe he was just testing us. Intent on showing both God and his mother that his future was meant to be in the north, Ramon, now with a hundred dollars in gold coins, and accompanied again by Mariano and another friend, once again set off for the north, this time through Monterrey and Piedras Negras. Days later, after undergoing immigration formalities, including a physical check, a bath, and disinfection, Ramon and Mariano safely arrived in Eagle Pass, Texas. They moved on to El Paso to reunite with relatives, 
but soon, without informing their parents, the brothers ventured further west. Ramon was determined to chase his dream of a career and show business in Los Angeles. The family were not exactly thrilled to hear about Ramon and Mariano's change of plans, but the reports back to the family from LA caused a shift in their thinking. It was time to say goodbye to the Garden of Eden and enter the madness of a young, explosive, and wild Los Angeles. In the autumn of 1917, the Samaniego family made their journey to join Ramon and Mariano. Their train ride from Durango to El Paso was marked by the grim sight of bodies hanging from telephone poles along the route. A terrifying reminder of the violence perpetrated by rebels, rogue government soldiers, and bandits across the desolate landscapes of northern Mexico. Despite these dangers, they safely arrived in El Paso in November 1917. Ramon and Mariano had reached Los Angeles on Thanksgiving Day of the previous year. At first, they resided with their uncle, Dr. Jose Samaniego, and his family in a house located approximately two miles west of downtown Los Angeles. The brothers lived with their uncle until sometime in 1917. The brothers, especially Ramon, encountered tough financial times in their early days in Los Angeles. Thrilled by the allure of Hollywood, and very much against his parents' wishes, Ramon put his opera aspirations on hold to venture into the film industry shortly after arriving. Gaining entry into the movie studios was relatively, in those days, easy due to lax security, but finding actual employment proved to be much more challenging. Ramon, with his dark hair, brown eyes, and handsome appearance, found himself in competition with thousands of others for the same roles. He recounted feeling despair, saying, I almost lost hope, but his breakthrough came with a minor role as an extra, which led him to believe his struggles were over, only to find out that wasn't the case at all. It took months before he got another opportunity, and he was drawn back into poverty once more. When work did arrive, it was usually grueling. Extras in that era had to endure long hours on set from early morning to late at night, without overtime compensation or modern conveniences. Regardless of the challenges and the slim chances of getting noticed for bigger parts, for Ramon, this was his entry point into the industry. His debut on screen was a small role as a Mexican bandit in the 1917 film The Jaguar's Claws by famous players Lasky, shot in the Mojave Desert. Excited for what he thought was his big break, Ramon decided to ham it up in a key scene. This grasping for attention didn't impress the director, Marshall Nealon, who quickly dismissed him from the scene. That year, Ramon also played minor roles as a German soldier in The Little American with Mary Pickford, and as an Aztec warrior in Cecil B. DeMille's The Woman God Forgot. With roles as an extra and bit part actor being infrequent, Ramon sought out other means to earn money, taking on jobs such as a grocery clerk and busboy at the Victor Hugo restaurant, a favorite among Hollywood celebrities. Ramon found another more unusual source of income by posing nude for art students at the J. Francis Smith School of Illustration and Painting. At a time when nude modeling was largely seen as scandalous by society, this job choice was particularly surprising, especially for someone who had once contemplated a life in the priesthood. But he considered himself an artist, and he believed that artists weren't bound by the conventional moral standards. During the summer of 1918, Ramon encountered a slice of good luck, that would change his career trajectory. Choreographer Marion Morgan, famous for her avant-garde dances, inspired by historical and mythical themes, was on the lookout for a male dancer. Her performances were a fixture in high-end vaudeville theaters and served as opening acts for films in the grander cinemas. Her search was specifically for someone unlikely to be conscripted into World War I. Morgan noticed Ramon during a local theater production. She ostensibly chose him for his physical appearance for the ballet, Attila and the Huns. Despite his modest height of 5 feet 6 inches, it's widely thought that his Mexican nationality, which exempted him from the draft, played a crucial role in her decision. 
while the other aspiring young men in Hollywood were being sent off to be plowed into a field in faraway Belgium by German artillery. Ramon would get his big opportunity, not in LA, but in New York City. By August, Ramon had departed his family's home for New York to start rehearsals for Attila. With no income from the rehearsals, he took a night job at the Horn and Hardart Automat on Broadway earning $1.60 per shift as a pastry boy. Struggling to balance his aspirations in show business with the need to make ends meet, Ramon faced physical exhaustion and sore feet, which did nothing for his performance and dance rehearsals. This led to his dismissal, although he was soon rehired after his replacement performed even less satisfactorily. Ramon's adaptability shone through, and by the early autumn, he joined the Attila and the Huns Ensemble for a tour across the Orpheum Theater Circuit in the northern United States and Canada. Darylis Perdue, a slim brunette and one of Ramon's regular dance partners, also found herself drawn romantically to the young performer. However, Ramon's affections were directed elsewhere. Under Emperor Maximilian's reign, the introduction of the Code of Napoleon had led to the decriminalization of same-sex relationships in Mexico. However, societal attitudes remained largely unchanged, with effeminate men often facing police harassment, and accusations of homosexual behavior could still lead to imprisonment, regardless of the law. In fact, many Mexicans were either unaware or indifferent to the legality of same-sex relationships, while the United States, particularly Los Angeles, wasn't as explicitly hostile towards homosexuals as Mexico. It was still a far cry from being a welcoming environment for them. Ramon would need time to fully understand and accept his own sexuality, knowing full well that very few other people would. As Ramon was tenaciously working towards his dream in New York, a sudden catastrophe jeopardized both his family's and his own future back in Los Angeles. One evening, 11-year-old Carmen left a candle burning in the attic to join her family for dinner, inadvertently setting the stage for a crisis. Soon, the attic was ablaze. The entire Samaniego family scrambled to save what they could, but as the fire spread quickly, they were forced to watch helplessly as their home was consumed by flames. Firefighters eventually quelled the fire, yet the water they used did as much harm as the fire, if not more, with much of the family's belongings either damaged or stolen by looters. Left without a place to stay, the Samaniegos decided against leaving Los Angeles, relying instead on the support of Dr. Samaniego's brother and the local Mexican community, while they rebuilt their lives and found a new home. Meanwhile, Ramon returned to LA to capitalize on his recent success. Towards the end of 1920, Ramon secured a genuine film role in Goldwyn's Mr. Barnes of New York where he was credited as the Corsican youngster, Antonio Paoli. Although it was a small role, Paoli is killed off in a duel shortly after appearing. It was pivotal in the film's revenge storyline, yet any anticipation Ramon harbored for immediate fame dissipated when Goldwyn decided to postpone the release of Mr. Barnes of New York, probably due to a surplus of productions at the studio. Ramon's fortunes in the industry improved by the summer of 1921 with the part in Omar Khayyam. The female lead was cast in late June with 18-year-old Kathleen Key, a beauty contest victor, getting the role. The male lead, according to Evend, director of Ferdinand P. Earl's son, came to the front door one day and was hired. Besides acting, Ramon was also tasked with choreographing the film's dance scenes. He just thought I was terrible, Navarro remembered years later, about director Ferdinand P. Earle's first reaction to his scenes. Nonetheless, Earle pushed forward with the film and with his leading man. After its completion, producer Theodore Ahrens took several reels of the film without Earle's consent, criticized it for being overly artistic for its $65,000 budget, which was average for studio films at the time and had it edited without Earl's involvement. Earl then sought legal action to prevent its release. Ramon later expressed regret about this, saying, It may never be shown to the public, 
but such a beautiful screen poem it is. So sensual. In September 1922, over a year after its completion, a shortened version of the film was screened to a select group of studio executives, financiers, artists, critics, and high society. This episode showed Navarro just what could go wrong in filmmaking, and how easily a project could spiral into a nightmare. However, Ramon's next role in The Prisoner of Zenda would find much greater success. Set in the fantastical realm of Ruritania, the story is one of love, deceit, valor, avarice, swapped identities, and thrilling duels. During the making of The Conquering Power in 1921, director Rex Ingram supposedly singled out Ramon from among the extras, viewing him as a possible replacement for the increasingly demanding Rudolph Valentino. Ingram purportedly declared his intent to make Ramon a star as a lesson to Valentino, hoping to show him he wasn't as irreplaceable as he believed. But years later, Navarro dismissed this narrative as fabricated studio hype, clarifying, that was studio publicity, the usual bunk. It didn't happen like that at all. This was the moment, however, that Ramon Samaniego became Ramon Navarro, albeit partially due to a typo, where his name was spelled with an O, rather than the more common A. With The Prisoner of Zenda positioned as one of the key releases of 1922, Ramon saw it as his pivotal moment to establish himself as a leading man, working under his master, Ingram. Aware that a failure could close doors for him, he thankfully received unwavering support from both the director and the lead actress. But it wouldn't be easy. Ingram was styling Navarro to be exactly like Valentino, even down to measuring the placement of the part in his hair so that it was identical. Zenda was a big hit, with both critics and moviegoers, opening up new opportunities for all concerned. During filming, Ingram and his leading lady, Alice Terry, began a love affair that led to them slipping away from the shoot to get married one morning before heading back to work as a kind of honeymoon. Meanwhile, Ramon developed a close bond with supporting player Barbara Lamar, one of the great vamps of the silent era, and you can hear all about her brief but spectacular life in the video linked on screen now. But back to Ramon Navarro. Shortly over a month after wrapping up The Prisoner of Zenda, filming commenced on Ingram's Black Orchids, a reimagining of his own 1917 Universal film. Grant Wittick, the film editor, remarked that the original had, in his words, been murdered by the front office for being too erotic. Ingram said this time he would make it twice as erotic. In Black Orchids, Ramon took on dual roles, as Yvonne de Maupin, the object of the vamp's affection, and as Henri, a suitor in the film's secondary plot. By current standards, his performance might not seem particularly subtle, yet compared to Valentino's, Navarro's portrayal was significantly more restrained. His expressions often conveyed mischief rather than menace, adding a lighter tone to his characters. The reviews for Trifling Women, the eventual title of Black Orchids, despite Ingram's objections, were mixed upon its debut at New York's Astor Theater. While the New York Times appreciated his portrayal of the romantic lead, others found Navarro's performance lacking. The critiques of Ingram's work were similarly divided, with some acknowledging his unique directorial vision and others less impressed. Filmmaker Michael Powell, a genius director in his own right, had a much more positive appraisal. He explained what the film meant to him moonlight on tiger skins, and blood dripping onto white faces, while sinister apes, poison, and lust keep the plot moving. The film opted for minimal use of intertitles, preferring to rely on its rich gothic ambience to set the tone. Harrison's report hailed it as an unquestionable masterpiece. Even with lingering skepticism about Navarro's star quality, and despite trifling women not achieving the blockbuster status Metro and Ingram had hoped for, some industry insiders began acknowledging the promise in Ingram's mentee. Navarro himself shared that Samuel Goldwyn praised his work in The Prisoner of Zenda as the finest thing he had seen, subsequently offering him a lucrative two-year deal 
at $2,500 a week. During this period, Navarro's personal life didn't seem to hinder his professional ascent. He kept his relationship with his publicist, Herbert Howe, secret, and few people seemed to suspect that Navarro could be gay. Studio bosses, meanwhile, were far more acute than the average person when it came to the sexual lives of their stars. But Navarro was turning into a moneymaker, so they would do their best to keep things under wraps. Focused on his ambition to excel in film, he aimed not just for personal success, but also to alleviate his family's financial burdens. His dedication was paying off, as evidenced by his next collaboration with Ingram on an ambitious adaptation of Raphael Sabatini's 1921 hit novel, Scaramouche, a romance of the French Revolution. Production was slated to start on St. Patrick's Day, 1923, but reportedly, the festivities got in the way, with the Dublin-born Ingram extending his celebrations for ten full days of drinking. Ingram's unique and whiskey-drenched directorial style contributed to Scaramouche, exceeding its production schedule and budget. Expected to wrap by midsummer, editing stretched into September, and the final tally of $858,000 in costs raised eyebrows at Metro with concerns that the film's expenditures might not be recoupable. However, by year's end, Scaramouche earned a spot as the sixth best film in the film's daily annual critics poll. When it officially hit theaters in February 1924, it emerged as a major box office triumph. Despite being listed after Alice Terry in the credits, Navarro was undeniably the film's luminary. He was on the rise now, without a doubt. By the end of 1923, approximately two years after advancing from minor roles, Ramon Navarro had climbed to Hollywood's premier ranks. His rapid ascent was bolstered, not only by his ties to one of cinema's leading directors, but also by the scant competition in the role of the industry's leading young male heartthrob. Also by this time, Ingram and Metro had come to the understanding that casting Navarro in the stereotypical role of a Latin lover was not only misaligned with his true character, but also risked pigeonholing him as merely an imitation of Valentino, rather than allowing him to carve out his distinct place in Hollywood. From here, Navarro would begin to develop his own unique on-screen persona. As Ramon Navarro's fame grew, the public became increasingly fascinated with his personal life. The question of whether he was married was definitely answered with a no, though the studio played along with a Hollywood fantasy by circulating rumors of romantic liaisons with female stars, which were as quickly denied as they were suggested. However, Navarro wasn't interested in maintaining a playboy image off camera, not only due to his preference for men, but also because he valued his privacy and time with his family at their home on Constant Street. Interestingly, Navarro's strong religious beliefs did not deter him from embracing both his sexuality and non-traditional religious views. This allowed him to maintain a concealed, yet fulfilling relationship with Howe. Navarro's next collaboration with Ingram was on the Arab, filmed in North Africa. This project was undertaken amidst a challenging studio environment that strained the relationship between directors and the studio heads Louis B. Mayer and Irving Thalberg causing Ingram considerable stress. The Arab turned out to be a Pyrrhic victory for Ingram. After returning to the U.S. in early 1924, the pressures of Hollywood led him to a nervous breakdown, prompting him to leave the film industry and spend much of his time in New York. Despite his departure, Ingram was recognized as one of Hollywood's top directors and is still respected by silent film fans today. Navarro's career had flourished under Ingram's mentorship through a series of five films, propelling him from obscurity to Hollywood fame. Yet, with Ingram's exit from Hollywood, the actor faced uncertainties about his future career path. Navarro now confronted the daunting task of navigating Hollywood's evolving landscape and studio politics without the guidance of his trusted mentor. Ingram leaving not only marked a professional setback for Navarro, but also dealt a personal blow. Their friendship was close, and some have since suggested that they were more than merely friends, 
although no concrete evidence of a romantic side to their friendship has ever been established. However, Navarro didn't need to dwell on these concerns for long, as his most significant career achievement was just on the horizon. Before The Prisoner of Zenda even hit theaters, back when Navarro was still credited as Samaniegos, some in Hollywood had already touted him as the ideal candidate for the lead in Ben-Hur. What followed was a period filled with rampant speculation regarding the colossal Ben-Hur production. The decision-making process became chaotic and the budget spiraled wildly. With Ingram out of the picture, it seemed Navarro's chance at the lead was gone. And indeed, Goldwyn made the odd choice of casting the clean-cut, athletic, all-American boy George Walsh for the role of the mysterious and exotic Ben-Hur. However, as the fiasco grew out of all control, Goldwyn eventually decided to pull the trigger and fire both the director and the lead and start from scratch with a new team. On a Sunday in early June 1924, a phone call during lunchtime from Irving Thalberg beckoned Navarro to the studio. There, Thalberg dropped the bombshell. Navarro had been chosen to play Ben-Hur. This came as a shock to Navarro despite press whispers of major changes to rescue the troubled film. Thalberg had two stipulations. He first insisted Navarro screen test for the role immediately, which Navarro boldly declined, suggesting Thalberg check out his performance and where the pavement ends instead. Thalberg acquiesced. Secondly, Thalberg required Navarro to temporarily suspend his studio contract, meaning no pay raise for Ben-Hur and that Navarro would cover his own expenses while filming overseas. Navarro agreed with the caveat that Herbert Howe accompany him for PR duties. Moving from astonishment to excitement, Navarro couldn't wait to share the news with Howe about the upcoming adventure in Italy. George Walsh, on the other hand, would never forgive Navarro, believing him to have schemed his way into the role. The following day in utmost secrecy, Navarro was chauffeured to the Pasadena train station, from where he embarked on his covert journey to Europe. But by this time, Ben-Hur had become a monster, ready to consume all who dared enter the production. As filming for Ben-Hur pressed on, under the new direction of Fred Niblo, B. Reeves Eason, known for his work on B-Westerns and his experience as a horseman, was enlisted to oversee the iconic chariot races preparations. Major challenges persisted, especially due to the track's poor condition. During one scene, Navarro made a misstep, causing his chariot to crash and be overturned by a pack of horses. Spectators feared the worse, believing Navarro might have perished, but he miraculously emerged from the wreckage without a scratch. The actor, already discontent with the slow progress of the film, grew increasingly frustrated with what he viewed as unfair treatment from director Fred Niblo and the production team. Before the dangerous chariot scenes, Navarro had undertaken another risky stunt. In this scene, Ben-Hur and his eventual Roman ally, Quintus Arius, are depicted clinging to a piece of wreckage at sea. Navarro, clad only in a minimal garment, and Frank Currier, who was 75 at the time, endured bitterly cold conditions during the three-day filming in the Mediterranean. Stand-ins meant to substitute for them during setup shots and wide angles called for assistance after enduring the cold water for just 20 minutes. Additionally, Navarro was dealing with poisoning from the heavy, toxic makeup used on set. In a particularly demanding scene, he was physically pulled by his hair 36 times as assistant director Al Rabak demanded multiple takes, leading Navarro to show Rabak his hair falling out in handfuls and refuse another take. Director Niblo was seen as a harsh overseer, pushing actors, extras, and crews to their limit. While the studio showed little concern for their well-being, its primary focus was on controlling the film's already ballooning budget, which saw an increase of nearly $650,000 from September to December. During this period, Thalberg experienced a heart attack which some speculated was due to the stress of managing Ben-Hur. At the premiere, anticipation was sky high. Audience members wondered if the vast investment of time, money, and effort 
would be evident in the final product. When Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, appeared on screen, it was met with polite applause. As the movie unfolded, the excitement of the sophisticated Broadway audience built up, culminating in an ecstatic response to the chariot race scene and ending in a roaring standing ovation for the film and its creators. Navarro, the film's star, was notably absent from the premiere, officially due to a severe cold, though rumors suggested he had stage fright. Another theory was that his publicist, Herbert Howe, advised against attending, arguing that an actor of such a grand role should maintain an aura of mystique. The following day, New York's newspapers were abuzz with praise for Ben-Hur, with the New York Times describing it as probably the most comprehensive and important spectacular subject that has ever been filmed. Industry magazines like Photoplay were even more lavish in their commendations, heralding Ben-Hur as a masterpiece and a must-see for everyone. On October 8, 1927, Ben-Hur was released across the country to packed theaters. The film also garnered international acclaim, breaking box office records in numerous cities around the globe. Even years after its debut, French poet, filmmaker, and dramatist Jean Cocteau praised the film's enduring charm, the epic par excellence. By early 1927, Navarro and Herbert Howe had been in a relationship for over three years. Howe and Navarro enjoyed their time together in Beverly Hills, away from Howe's brother Milton, with whom Herbert had shared a home in the Hollywood Hills and the ever-present Samaniego family. Howe's role was ostensibly as a publicist, but he was a powerful figure in the industry. His articles and photoplay could make or break an actor, and inevitably Navarro was getting very good press in the magazine. Howe and Navarro were often seen together, a fact which Howe brushed off by calling Ramon his closest friend and best traveling companion. Furthermore, Howe and Navarro were in cahoots with the studio to fabricate various stories about Ramon's affairs with famous women. In late January, Howe and Navarro had plans to vacation in Europe. However, the sudden passing of Navarro's dear friend and frequent co-star, Barbara Lamar, prompted a change in plans while they were already in New York, preparing to set sail. Upon hearing the news, he and Howe canceled their European vacation and returned to California for the funeral services, which were held in a Culver City chapel. Following this, a grieving Navarro continued his career, still highly sought after. In fact, he was more in demand than ever, following the early death of his Latin lover rival, Rudolph Valentino, in 1926. The appropriately titled Lovers premiered in New York on April 9, 1927, receiving only mixed reviews, however. After the student prince, Navarro, whose salary had recently increased to $5,000 per week, began working on Romance, an adaptation of the 1903 novel by Joseph Conrad and Ford Maddox Ford. However, it too failed to match the success of Ben-Hur, with both critical and box office disappointment. Meanwhile, Navarro's peers at MGM, including Long Chaney, John Gilbert, and newcomer William Haynes, were delivering hits like Mr. Wu, Tell It to the Marines, Flesh and the Devil, Love, and La Boheme, each picture earning the studio over a million dollars worldwide and closing the gap to Navarro in terms of star power. While Navarro's career hadn't plummeted, it wasn't exactly soaring in the aftermath of his Ben-Hur success, as he might have hoped. Adding to his professional anxieties, was the rapid transition of the film industry to sound films. Although Navarro possessed a remarkable voice, there was a pervasive concern that actors with notable accents might struggle in the era of talkies. His personal life was also suffering, as he broke off his clandestine relationship with Howe in 1928. This led an embittered Howe to dramatically change the tone of his articles on Navarro, and one he wrote, off screen, he is a theater with the lights out. During this tumultuous period, Navarro's brother Jose had been confined to his bed for one year. Despite brief moments of seeming recovery, Jose's condition worsened, 
By early 1929, he was under constant medical care, but it was insufficient. Jose passed away on February 22, 1929, at the age of 23, with his death attributed to complications from a past football injury. Racked with grief, Navarro decided the only thing to do was quit Hollywood and join the priesthood at El Retiro, but his inquiries were met with rejection. His recent performance as a half-nude Jewish movie god, who had set female pulses racing across the world, probably did little to improve his chances with the clergymen. Nonetheless, Navarro experienced a career revival with the February 9, 1929 release of The Flying Fleet, originally titled Gold Braid. The film received the highest acclaim of any Navarro project since Ben-Hur, but rather than capitalize on this success, he decided to defy his bosses and fans and head to Europe to fulfill a long-held dream. He was warned that he was throwing away his career as an actor, but he was determined to sing on Europe's opera circuit. The escapade was a disaster, and he failed to make his debut. On top of these issues, he was under the constant pressure that came with fame. Navarro, with the priesthood and the opera now close to him, sought escape through drinking. The exact moment when Navarro's casual drinking spiraled into dependency is unclear, but it undoubtedly began during this tumultuous period. Known to enjoy a drink, Howe once noted in a column that despite rumors of Navarro being a novice to cocktails, he was actually quite the expert, but his expertise was about to become seriously dangerous. As Navarro navigated his early personal and career ups and downs, his social life became busier, likely contributing to an increase in his alcohol consumption. While there were periods of sobriety, especially when working on new projects, alcohol remained a significant issue for him for the rest of his life. MGM's strategy to ease Navarro into sound films involved casting him in Devil May Care, highlighting his singing talent, which had been well received in The Pagan. The film's promotion dubbed him the golden voice of the silver screen, assuring audiences of the pleasure of both hearing him speak and sing. Contrary to concerns, Navarro's accent was generally well-received by critics, despite it not always matching his character's various European backgrounds. Now 30, the Mexican actor was often likened to Maurice Chevalier, a French actor who was a decade his senior. Navarro's charm and talent helped make Devil May Care one of his most successful films, grossing over $1 million internationally. Navarro now began to venture into speakeasies, popular with the gay community. To avoid speculation, he would often be seen with a female companion, like Elsie Janice or Alice Terry, who were happy to help provide cover on these lavender dates. This arrangement allowed him to maintain his privacy while enjoying the nightlife, blending in with other celebrities who, regardless of their sexual orientation, frequented such venues for entertainment and socializing. At the end of 1930, Ramon Navarro returned to MGM to take the lead in a film adaptation of Arthur Schnitzler's dark novel, Daybreak. Initially envisioned as a musical with Oscar Strauss's compositions, the shifting tides against musicals led to the removal of all songs from the project. Daybreak struggled at the box office, receiving a slew of negative critiques. Part of its lackluster performance was attributed to Navarro's portrayal of an aloof Austrian officer a role that diverged a little too far from the passionate characters his fans adored. On the other hand, Mata Hari succeeded remarkably well and was one of the biggest hits of the year. It's worth mentioning that Navarro never actually said the infamous and often mocked line, what's the matter, Mata, in the film, though it contained plenty of other dubious dialogue and scenarios. Greta Garbo as the lead naturally captivated audiences, yet the film's unexpected commercial success was a major bonus for Navarro. The allure of two big stars and the studio-generated rumors of steamy off-screen romance propelled Mata Hari to rake in over $2 million globally. However, Navarro's prominence at MGM was fleeting. In August 1932, during tough economic conditions, 
Louis B. Mayer requested Navarro and other MGM stars to take a pay cut, as the studio's profits had fallen to their lowest since 1925. While sex requests were made to several actors, certain names like Gable, Garbo, and Shearer were not included in the cuts. This move indicated that Navarro's time as MGM's leading man had come to an end, as salary reductions were seemingly asked only of those whose box office draw was in decline. His next project was The Barbarian, alongside Myrna Loy. This was a remake of his earlier film, The Arab, and one of the final films made pre-Code. However, the arrival of the Code meant that The Barbarian was widely banned due to Myrna's half-nude appearance in the film. Work opportunities continued for Navarro into the spring of 1933, with MGM gearing up for his first musical in three years, The Cat and the Fiddle. This film adaptation of Jerome Kern and Odo Harbach's 1931 operetta portrayed a tale of romantic entanglements within the European music scene. Following the completion of The Cat and the Fiddle, Navarro moved on to Laughing Boy in 1934 with fellow Mexican Lupe Velez. Censorship issues also plagued this film. Joseph Breen from the Hayes office criticized Laughing Boy as unsuitable for audiences due to its content, demanding the removal of references to prostitution and scenes suggestive of illicit relations. MGM partially complied with these demands. They need not have bothered, as critics savaged the film, being particularly harsh on Navarro's aging appearance likely partly due to his increasing alcohol consumption. However, the inconvenience of increased censorship paled in comparison to the threat posed by the emerging communist blacklists, a police operation targeting the headquarters of the cannery, an agricultural workers industrial union in Sacramento, uncovered names including Navarro, Dolores Del Rio, Lupe Velez, and James Cagney implicating them as potential communist supporters. This discovery led to Sacramento District Attorney, Neil McAllister, labeling them as suspected communist sympathizers amidst broader efforts to suppress any actions deemed subversive to the government. McAllister's proposed legal measures sought to penalize those involved without the need for a jury trial, even suggesting court injunctions against the actors should their sympathies be confirmed. The actors implicated vehemently refuted these allegations. Cagney, for one, firmly denied any support for communist causes, suggesting McAllister was leveraging the situation for his own publicity at the cost of their reputations. It seems that the stars had been seemingly innocently asked to make a donation to hungry farm workers without realizing the ties the union had to communism and now both sides were looking to exploit the big names to further their political ends. Lupe Velez and her so-called hot tamale persona decided to trot out a line more befitting to one of Cagney's on-screen mobster characters, asking, what's a communist, when questioned? But false ignorance aside, this was a dangerous time for anyone who had even so much as had a coffee with a political radical. The Night is Young signaled the conclusion of Navarro's time with MGM. Despite initial plans to cast him alongside Jeanette MacDonald or Evelyn Leigh in Love While You May, MGM had had enough of Navarro. He was called in to meet with Eddie, the fixer, Mannix, a man not known for his willingness to negotiate. Ramon was told in no uncertain terms that MGM was buying out the rest of his contract and his career was over. Navarro concurred with the assessment. On January 3, 1935, he left MGM with $19,000 in severance, officially parting ways with the studio. The public was informed about this development on February 7th, the day after Navarro turned 36, and several weeks following the debut of The Night is Young. MGM's statement to fans explained there was no conflict behind Navarro's departure, Rather, he had requested to be released from his contract during a lull in production. Most meetings with brutal enforcer Mannix tended to have this kind of very press-friendly outcome for the studio, unsurprisingly. 
contrary to some film historians' suggestions. Navarro's decline in Hollywood wasn't due to homophobia or dwindling interest in exotic leading men. Despite rumors attributing his departure to a scandalous discovery, or its ultimatums from studio head Louis B. Mayer demanding Navarro marry. These speculations lack concrete evidence. Instead, it's unlikely that marriage alone would have reversed the financial disappointments of Navarro's recent films, which resulted in a $760,000 loss. Navarro's focus on his opera ambitions and priestly interests distracted him from advocating for more advantageous roles and collaborations. Potential projects with Garbo or McDonald, who were hugely popular internationally, could have turned his career around. For instance, Navarro could have fit well into Queen Christina as the Spanish ambassador, a role that Garbo, given their positive working relationship, might have supported over John Gilbert. Similarly, the lead in The Merry Widow, which went to Maurice Chevalier, could have been an opportunity for Navarro but he was overlooked, partly due to his unfocused approach to his career, and undoubtedly due to his heavy drinking. Mayer and Thalberg's illogical casting decisions also contributed to Navarro's career challenges, often placing him in roles that didn't suit him. They claimed to choose his roles carefully, yet this carefulness didn't necessarily equate to wisdom. For example, a certain young man was a poor follow-up to Ben-Hur, and similarly disappointing choices continued with Huddle, after Mata Hari, and Laughing Boy as a successor to The Cat and the Fiddle. Films like The Sun Daughter and Son of India also played a part in diminishing Navarro's appeal, both domestically and internationally. If MGM's executives had realized that Ramon Navarro's charm, as their former leading man, was rooted in his flair for light romance, his career with the studio might not have concluded in 1935. But it's important to look at his career in the context of the era. While he certainly had plenty more to offer, he outlasted many of his contemporaries. Navarro was the final star from the original Metro Pictures roster to see his name fade from prominence, and he was the penultimate original MGM contract star to depart with Norma Shearer exiting seven years after him. Over nearly 11 years and 22 films, including an epic blockbuster, Navarro generated over $31 million for the Culver City studio, a figure surpassed only by Joan Crawford's 36 movies. Nonetheless, it would be 15 years before Navarro returned to an MGM soundstage. He put a brave face on it, and was outwardly relaxed about his departure from MGM. He told reporters it was a period of, as he put it, wisdom and happiness. But Navarro harbored concerns about what lay ahead. After enjoying more than a decade of fame, he now faced an uncertain career future. Though financially stable, and with less responsibility towards his now grown-up siblings, he would miss the regular income MGM had provided. The harsh reality was that his star had dimmed. At 36, he found himself on the outskirts of Hollywood success. The phone calls from friends and film offers had dwindled, and the roles that did come his way were often not to his liking. Navarro didn't stop searching for scripts that might reignite his career. He aspired to star in 20th Century Fox's The Rains Came, a role that ultimately went to the studio's leading man, Tyrone Power. While Hollywood's interest waned, regional theaters showed more enthusiasm for a weekly fee of $200, far less than his MGM earnings, but on par with theatrical legends like Ethel Barrymore and Ina Clare, Navarro found work in summer stock theater. However, this period supposed wisdom and happiness didn't curb his drinking habits. Navarro frequently drove under the influence leading to multiple car accidents. Yet these incidents failed to prompt a reevaluation of his relationship with alcohol. In fact, the relationship only darkened in a kind of triumvirate of negative forces. He was driven by his deep Catholicism, which in turn generated enormous guilt about his homosexuality, but he couldn't suppress his true self. 
and so he would drink and then drive around LA to pick up men at well-known spots. Often racked with guilt and uncertainty, he would drink even more to develop the courage, and this led to multiple car crashes while under the influence. His most severe accident to date led to an emergency intervention by a doctor who happened upon the crash. Navarro detailed in a letter how the doctor revived him at the scene by pulling him from the wreckage, administering alcohol orally and via injection, and dislodging his swallowed tongue. A quick-thinking act Navarro credited with saving his life. The accident left him hospitalized for two and a half weeks, nursing a concussion, two broken ribs, a severely bruised chest, a chin cut, and a dislocated ankle, which required six weeks in a cast. Notably, Navarro's recounting omits any concern for the other driver involved, who also sustained injuries in the crash. The same man, known for his generosity with money, also displayed unmistakable self-centeredness when it came to evading blame, whether it came from legal issues, family and friends' judgments, or his own conscience. However, these efforts to place the blame on others were largely unsuccessful. Legal authorities repeatedly found him guilty of reckless driving. His family expressed deep embarrassment over his arrests related to drunk driving. Navarro did understand the gravity of his addiction and his inability to overcome it. His only recourse was throwing himself into pious but unsustainable religious purity for a period before collapsing back into heavy drinking and casual sex again. This led to a continuous loop of guilt over his sexuality and drinking habits, interspersed with episodes of devout abstinence, and then lapses back into either sexual encounters or alcohol use, perpetuating a cycle of guilt and repentance. In the early 1940s, Navarro was involved with a much younger man, Don Atkins, during this time, Navarro provided Atkins with a house in Hollywood, showing his generosity again. Don said later that by now, Navarro was reminiscent of a more compassionate male version of Sunset Boulevard's Norma Desmond. Atkins recounted being present during another of Navarro's drunken driving incidents in October 1941, when Navarro, too intoxicated to operate his vehicle, ended up spending a night in jail before contacting his lawyer and securing release on $50 bail. This would be the pattern for much of the rest of the decade, interspersed with various failures to reignite his career on screen and on stage. In one humiliating experience, he was laughed off the stage in London during the opening of a theatrical performance of The Prisoner of Zenda. In the 1950s, Navarro found himself embracing solitude. This shift from a previously highly social life, along with his regular engagements with clergy at the Pala Assistencia and visits to Catholic retreats across the nation, reignited speculation about him possibly pursuing a monastic life. But his monastic aspirations never materialized, partly because he was now considered too old to join religious orders in his early 50s. By this time, Navarro's youthful appearance had faded, and his fame no longer resonated with the younger generation, who were mere infants during his Scaramouche and Ben-Hur days. The allure he once held for young, attractive men had also diminished, leading him a life in which the only sex he ever had was paid. Somehow, Navarro managed to avoid public scandals, either through sheer good fortune or by settling potential blackmail attempts. His risky behavior of driving drunk through Hollywood in search of companionship was a potential magnet for the press and for people who would jump at the opportunity to exploit a lonely, vulnerable, and wealthy figure. He wasn't giving up entirely on his career, and he employed the notorious beauty guru, Madame Sylvia, around this time. She would later publish a salacious autobiography, detailing the things she saw behind the closed doors of several movie stars. What she revealed about Navarro was that he allegedly slept in a coffin, a perfect replica of one he had seen in the Vatican. Whether this was true or not is unknown, although he may well have owned one, and being something of a joker, claimed to have slept in it. 
Madame Sylvia's treatments were known for their barbaric and painful nature. The stocky Norwegian would literally squeeze the fat off her clients and finish the job with what amounted to a minor beating. Gloria Swanson was a major enthusiast of these dubious methods, but Navarro did land one final role, so perhaps they were effective. Heller in Pink Tights ended up being Navarro's final film appearance. Despite a 1959 announcement by the Los Angeles Times about a role opposite Sal Mineo and a remake of The Pagan, the project never materialized, along with other potential film opportunities, due in part to production cancellations or financial disagreements over Navarro's salary demands. Outside of his dwindling acting career, Navarro's struggle with alcoholism persisted. In May 1960, he faced arrest twice, within two days for drunk driving. His subsequent trial in June 1960 resulted in a deadlock over the misdemeanor charge, but he was nonetheless fined $250 by a judge for driving under the influence of non-narcotic substances, marking another low point in his battle with addiction. On February 20th, 1962, almost two years following his most recent arrest for drunk driving, and just two weeks after celebrating his 63rd birthday, Navarro was involved in a collision. He ran a red light at the intersection of Sunland Boulevard and San Fernando Road in Sun Valley, not far from his home on Riverside Drive, and crashed into another car. Failing yet another sobriety test, he found himself under arrest for the fourth time in just over three years. During this incident, Navarro reportedly told the police officers, I am old and I just want to die, a statement that propelled the incident into the global media spotlight. It was surprising that Navarro, whose peak fame had been decades ago, received an outpouring of sympathy from around the world, with letters and telegrams arriving from as far away as Ghana and Pakistan. Some correspondents admonished him for giving up on life while others pleaded with him to dismiss any thoughts of ending his life. Joan Crawford extended her support, offering her companionship during these tough times. One fan made a poignant request. If Navarro still harbored thoughts of death, she asked him to call her collect to sing Pagan Love Song one last time. Navarro's health had significantly declined, with diagnoses including cirrhosis of the liver and a condition that prevented his blood from clotting properly, likely due to years of alcohol misuse, leaving visible bruises on his skin. In January 1963, after years of smoking, he was diagnosed with emphysema and heart problems, and he also began to suffer from bouts of pleurisy, which made breathing both difficult and painful. Additionally, the prospect of jail time loomed over him like the Sword of Damocles, exacerbating his anxiety. He described himself as a nervous wreck. To compound this, he was about to be hit with more grief. In a tragic turn of events, Herbert Howe, who had briefly reprised his role as Navarro's publicist, died on October 23, 1966, following a fall and a rapid decline in health due to chronic cardiovascular issues. His passing at the age of 66 received little attention from the media world that he had once been a prominent part of. While tightening his budget in other areas, Navarro didn't hold back on spending for sexual companionship. The extent of these interactions over the years varied. One such active phase occurred in the latter half of 1968. Navarro, often so inebriated that his handwriting was almost illegible, issued close to 140 checks in this time typically valued between $20 and $40. These were made out to various so-called gardeners and masseurs, particularly from a business dubbed Masseurs the Best, located on Fountain Avenue in Hollywood. Not all of these meetings necessarily led to sexual encounters. At times, Navarro was too intoxicated to engage physically, opting instead to wander around naked or engage in non-sexual physical contact while his visitors watched TV before Navarro drifted off to sleep. But falling asleep drunk and naked with near strangers in your house was risky. It seems his companions were, on the whole, honest. 
he was robbed on a couple of occasions, which led him to stop keeping any significant amounts of money in the house. His habit of offering generous tips and the fact that sexual acts weren't always expected made him well-liked among male escorts. Additionally, he sometimes promised to help his younger visitors break into the acting industry, which only added to his appeal. Although this was surely a pipe dream, as he was unable to get back into the industry himself. Petty thefts aside, some of these encounters turned aggressive. Navarro's perilous lifestyle and his seeming indifference to danger was described as a death wish by a friend, a sadly prescient observation. Hollywood's total indifference aside, he had maintained a loyal fan base in England through all these years, and on October 19th, 1968, the Ramon Navarro Film Club celebrated its 500th meeting. This was an event Navarro wished to attend in London, but was prevented from doing so by poor health. Instead, he received a congratulatory call from the club members. Notably, this was a year after homosexuality was decriminalized in England, something which would not happen in California until 1976. In the days that followed, Navarro's routine included attending daily mass, collecting unemployment benefits, tending to his garden, and succumbing to bouts of heavy drinking. A neighbor noted Navarro's tendency to drink more as Halloween approached, for reasons that are not entirely clear, but this was an observation made evident by his appearance and behavior when giving out treats. On October 30th, a young man Navarro had never met before contacted him. After a brief conversation detailing the caller's appearance, Navarro invited the sex worker over for drinks. The young man promised to arrive with his younger brother as soon as they secured transportation. Around 5.30 p.m. after preparing for their arrival, Navarro awaited his visitors, unaware that these would be the last individuals he would ever welcome into his home. On the morning of October 31st, Halloween, an employee named Edward Weber arrived for work at 3110 Laurel Canyon, finding the iron gates open, but the front door locked, leading him to enter through the kitchen. The living room was in disarray, with furniture upturned and a pair of glasses crushed on the floor. After calling out for Ramon and finding no response, Weber checked the master bedroom and bathroom but Navarro was missing. After a thorough search proved fruitless, Weber returned to the master bedroom, where a beam of sunlight revealed Navarro's body on the bed, showing signs of a severe beating. The police were called and quickly arrived, with over 20 officers securing the premises. The investigation revealed a half-eaten meal in the kitchen and an array of empty liquor bottles in the backyard. Among the evidence collected were a broken tooth, blood samples from the room, and a detailed examination of Navarro's injuries. Navarro's hands were bound with an electric cord, also wrapped around his ankles, and an initial carved into his neck, either an N or a Z. His body bore numerous injuries and bruises. A broken silver-tipped cane, one of his own movie mementos, was resting on his thigh. His brothers arrived to identify him, with one expressing shock over the sudden tragedy, noting Navarro had been in good spirits days earlier. The scene offered no signs of forced entry or clear motive, leaving the police with few leads, besides blood-stained clothing found near the property. But detectives set to work and quickly began to unravel the truth. Had Navarro's death been of natural causes, it might have received minimal attention. However, the violent nature of his murder thrust it into the global spotlight, with headlines across major newspapers dealing the tragic end of the once-celebrated film star, turning the focus on the mysteries surrounding his untimely death. The news coverage following Navarro's tragic end revisited his notable roles, including his iconic performance as Judah Ben-Hur and his on-screen partnership with Greta Garbo. Friends and acquaintances shared their shock and sadness over the loss of such a kind and refined individual. By November 2nd, three days post-discovery of Navarro's demise, police shared the grim details they had unearthed. The murder was estimated to have occurred between 9 and 9.30 p.m. on October 30th, 
with no evidence of forced entry, suggesting Navarro had willingly let in his assailant, yet no personal belongings seemed to have been taken. Investigations into Navarro's financial transactions unveiled over a hundred checks written to various gardeners and masseurs in the recent months, subtly exposing Navarro's sexuality and paving a new direction for this inquiry. To many, including his family, this revelation was genuinely shocking, as they had no idea he was gay, let alone engaging young men for sex. A name among these recipients, Larry Ortega, connected to an escort service, became a focal point. Further probing led police to a jail inmate familiar with Ortega and his circle, revealing a network of individuals involved in exchange for sexual favors and shedding light on a volatile figure related to Ortega, Paul Ferguson and his brother, Tom. With this lead, surveillance was initiated at Ortega's familial home. Concurrently, examination of Navarro's phone records identified a call to Chicago on the night of the murder, linking the case to Tom Ferguson in Los Angeles and prompting a deeper look into the backgrounds of the Ferguson brothers revealing a history of minor criminal activities and aggressive behavior. Fingerprint analysis soon connected the Ferguson brothers to the crime scene, leading to their arrest. Paul Ferguson faced murder and robbery charges without bail, while Tom, a minor, was detained in Juvenile Hall, where he reportedly boasted about his role in Navarro's death. What exactly happened that night is murky, as the brothers gave conflicting testimonies. Paul Ferguson claimed he fell asleep and was woken by his brother telling him that Navarro had passed away. Tom, on the other hand, gave a more detailed and seemingly credible series of events. Tom watched as his older brother bludgeoned Navarro on his bed, repeatedly demanding a sum of money they had been told he kept in the house. Navarro was not known to keep large sums of money at home, and so he could not give them anything. Tom backed out of the room while Paul finished Navarro off. Paul mutilated Navarro, including in intimate areas. Then they attempted to cover their tracks. They left notes referring to Larry Ortega, hoping that he might get the blame. They also scrawled various messages around the home, which were supposed to imply that Navarro had engaged female sex workers that night and that they were the ones responsible. They then stole some of Navarro's clothes and put them on, dumping their own bloody garments nearby. In the end, aside from the clothes, all they left with was a $20 bill they found in Navarro's pocket. A scandalous rumor arose that became part of Hollywood legend, but it seems to have been entirely fabricated. The rumor suggested that cops covered up the fact that Paul Ferguson had tortured Navarro to death by choking him with an Art Deco sex toy that once had belonged to Navarro's alleged secret lover, Rudolph Valentino. Navarro, so it was claimed, kept the piece in a shrine dedicated to Valentino at his home, but as we know, the two Latin lovers only met once, and there's little evidence that Valentino was gay or bisexual. The truth was far less dramatic, but nonetheless grim and violent, a sadly painful death for the aging and gentle star, who drowned on his own blood loss after being beaten severely by Ferguson. Navarro, an icon of old Hollywood, had been murdered on the day before Halloween, and just weeks before the Manson murders rocked Hollywood once again. It seemed symbolic, and a moment in which an old world was being replaced by a new, freer but more violent and dangerous one. On December 17th, a grand jury in Los Angeles heard the case against Paul and Tom Ferguson, accused of murdering Navarro, in a boxed robbery attempt, hoping to find $5,000, rumored to be in his house. They were charged with first-degree murder, as California law dictates that any death resulting from a robbery or torture qualifies as such, regardless of the perpetrator's direct involvement in the fatal act. Despite being underage, Tom was to face trial as an adult. The brothers were eventually convicted and served time for the murder, Though they were paroled in the mid-1970s, both found themselves back in prison for other offenses, serving longer sentences than they did for Navarro's murder. 
In a late interview, Paul Ferguson admitted his responsibility for the crime. Tom Ferguson ended his own life in 2005, while Paul Ferguson passed away in 2018 in prison. Navarro rests in Calvary Cemetery in East Los Angeles, and his legacy in the film industry is commemorated with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, located at 6350 Hollywood Boulevard. His legacy is one of the most dramatic and compelling of any early star, from fleeing a revolution and surviving poverty to being one of the most famous faces in the world at the time of Ben-Hur. Navarro lived it all, up and down, his struggles with addiction, spirituality, and his sexuality defined part of his life, but his good humor, talent, and success were very much in evidence for the fans who adored him at his peak and who still love him today. That's all from this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams. Yeah.